Hello, everyone. Welcome to North Central College 2020 Summer Webinar Series on COVID-19 Ripple Effects in Our Lives. I'm Jinai Sun, Associate Professor of Chinese at North Central College. I teach primarily Chinese language and culture, and aim to help students develop global competence. This includes how to communicate with Chinese people and understand their way of living and seeking out meaningful interactions with Chinese. To do this, students in my classes they use Chinese language media, like the networking app WeChat, which is similar to a combination of Facebook and Instagram. They also read Chinese newspapers and watch official government media like China Central Television or CCTV. Today, I want to use origin and the spread of COVID-19 in China to help understand the Chinese perspectives on how such crises are best managed, which in turn will help us understand China even the best of times. To help organize my lecture. I will break my story into three stages. In each stage, I will be introducing you to a single individual, whose story helps us see successive aspects of the Chinese response and experience. My first story is about the ophthalmologist, Dr. Wen Liangli, who was one of the first to know the existence of the virus, though his warning was initially suppressed by authorities. Tragically. He died of the virus itself in early February. My second story is of the author Feng Feng, a popular novelist. She began writing a Muhan Diary in the early days of the lockdown of that city in January. Feng Feng then became the subject of criticism as the virus spread across the world. Finally, I'll tell the story of Doctor Nan Shanzhong. A famous pomologist and a senior party member who helped successfully combat the SARS virus, which caused a smaller epidemic in China more than a decade ago. Dr. Zhong had made some notable statements about how the Chinese and other governments can help contain the virus through organized international action and scientific accountability. Many of you may have already heard about Dr. Wen Liangli, an ophthalmologist who worked at the, the Wuhan Central Hospital and became well known for having spread early news of a virus taking hold in Wuhan. Li wrote to a few medical school friends on WeChat on December 30, 2019, about how symptoms of the virus in Wuhan had similarities to the SARS virus. Which caused an epidemic from 2002 to 2003. Li told his colleagues to take care and protect their own friends and family from the new virus. However, when these messages became known to authorities in Wuhan, he was brought in for questioning along with a small number of other so-called rumor mongers. He was officially. Reprimanded and forced to admit to making false comments on the internet about new virus, but very soon after Li's message to his friends, health officials in Wuhan themselves announced the presence of the virus. Three weeks later, on January twenty-first, the Chinese national media began publicizing the dimensions of the deepening crisis in Wuhan. In a tragic turn of events, about a week after spending his warning messages, Li himself contracted COVID-19, the disease caused by the new coronavirus. A month later, in early February, he died. His early warning had by then made him a hero to millions of Chinese who, like Li, were arguing that the government had been wrong. To suppress information about the virus, eventually, after investigation, the Chinese Supreme, the Chinese Supreme People's Court agreed that Li should not have been demolished. 
the Chinese Supreme Court, the Chinese su the Chinese Supreme People's Court agreed that Li should not have been demolished, and he was soon afterwards officially named a mat martyr. Martyr was named a martyr, or Li Shi in Chinese, which is the highest level of honor bestowed on individuals who die in the service of China. Overall, this case exemplifies the early stages of the media response to the virus spread in China, a process of discovery and denial. His voice played a large role in the central government, changing their tone over the course of the first two months of the epidemic. To a certain degree, the central government had to allow for a fewer flow of information. So there has definitely been a shift in Chinese management of information about him, including a lot more sharing of data on the virus. In Confucian society like China's, authority for announcements, as important as possible, new epidemic is supposed to reside in those who occupy position of the political power. Now individuals like Li, but such hesitant and politically regulated messaging often means that a crisis like the coronavirus epidemic is worsened. Whether that is the case in Wuhan is not clear. But Li's story serves as a cautionary tale to anyone who would suppress information about such a crisis. If the first stage featured the denial and the discovery of the virus, the second stage leads from defensiveness to decisiveness about containing the virus. Then my second story turns to a writer living in Wuhan whose pen name is Fang Fang. She was already well known and popular for her novels and essays when Wuhan was officially locked down on January 24th. Fang Fang decided to keep a public journal about the lockdown to reflect on her sorrow, anger, and anxiety as the disease spread. Her daily post on the Chinese blogging platform Weibo soon became a window into life and death in Wuhan. Fang Fang's following on Weibo grew to 4 million and even more on WeChat. Southern would comment on each of her posts as soon as they were posted. People were hungry for information about conditions in Wuhan. News were still being heavily filtered by government censors and independent outlets were scarce in China. So Fang Fang quickly emerged as an independent source of information. Her reputation boosted by her standing as a popular writer. However, as the Chinese coronavirus epidemic spread and threatened to become a pandemic, that is a worldwide crisis, messaging in the West began to be more critical of China's official response. In turn, many Chinese went on the defensive. To them, Fang Fang's journal began to seem overly critical. Backlash against Fang Fang grew. And two, some nationalistic Chinese branded her a traitor for opening China up to undue criticism from Western media. An international translation of her journals led to bloggers on Weibo criticizing her for profiting from the crisis by focusing only on the dark side of events in Wuhan. The planned cover of the German edition of her book was accused of smearing China with its juxtaposition of a black mask and yellow text. By the end of this second phase of Chinese media response to the virus, we found that the initial ripples spreading from China began to be reflected back from the West. This process led to what we might call interference. As some parts of the message from China were amplified, 
while others were dampened. The changing response to Fang Fang's journal optimizes these kinds of effects. Fang Fang's message took on significance in the media that has led her to reflect on the need for Chinese to develop the confidence they need to hear the kinds of hopeful criticism she has had to offer. Others have complained that Fang Fang's theory provides biased view on Wuhan lockdown and has a negative impact on the overseas impression of Wuhan and China. But this seems to be another argument like we saw in the case of Wen Liangli. What Chinese need and many want is a range of perspectives in their media. If only one perspective is presented, of course, people view. If only one perspective is presented, of course, people's My final story is about the pathologist Nan Shan Zhong and the current official Chinese messaging about the virus and its containment. Dr. Zhong, who at age 83, is a very well-known and respected figure in China. He took a leading role in helping to contain the same SARS epidemic that had ravaged parts of China in the early 2000s and that Dr. Wen Liangli referred to in warning about the new virus in Wuhan. In fact, when Li Wen Liang died in February, Dr. Zhong hailed him as a hero for trying to warn others about the outbreak in Wuhan. Today, Zhong has become the most widely respected and trusted source of sometimes difficult news about the virus in China and much of the rest of the world. Some have compared Dr. Zhong to Dr. Anthony Fauci, who also built a reputation of respect for himself through his handling of a difficult past crisis. In Fauci's case, the AIDS epidemic. Both of them steadfastly provide clear and reliable reviews on the developing situation today. Dr. Zhong differs from Dr. Fauci mostly in how much support his views received from political officials. President Trump's own messaging has diverged from Dr. Fauci's. President Trump's own messaging has diverged from Dr. Fauci's often during the U.S. response and there have been continuing fears that Fauci may lose Trump's favor and his job coordinating efforts. Dr. Zhong, on the other hand, has been having the full support of the Chinese government and much popular support as well. Dr. Zhong today also gives strong support for the general measures China's government has taken and their effectiveness. He stresses the need for early diagnosis of possible cases, early quarantining of possibly infected individuals, and early treatment of confirmed cases. Today, the Chinese government is being very aggressive in testing for the virus. When a test came, when a test, when a test comes back positive, even if someone is asymptomatic, they are quarantined and the contact tracing is done to see who that person has been in touch with. This strict approach to containment has been very successful. Finally, Dr. Zhong has garnered international support for his recommendation through summit conferences with leading public health officials from various countries. In this light, I want to suggest that the keynote of the third large phase in the Chinese media's response is to position China as a global leader against the crisis with the experience, knowledge, and resources necessary to help contain the virus once and for all, not only in China. 
Well, I characterize this stage through the story of Dr. Zhang. I suggest that it began in late May, around the time of the National People's Congress, the yearly meeting of the Chinese legislature, at which new laws are discussed and ratified. The National People's Congress is usually held in March, but was delayed while the virus was still uncontained in China. The decision to hold the congress was like an announcement to China and the world that the virus had been beaten, and much of the messaging that came from the congress itself confirmed that idea. So now I wonder what your impression、uh, of the Chinese response to the coronavirus and the spread of the COVID nineteen. My own takeaway. Is that we have to be careful not to let ourselves be satisfied with one source of information, whether on coronavirus or other important issues. Seeking out a source of alternative information and protecting those sources from being silenced is a key to any healthy media ecosystem. I encourage you to keep whatever questions I have raised in mind. I encourage you to keep whatever questions I have raised in mind. Directly after my video, I will join you for a question and answer session. As you will see from the list of the topics, this series will cover topics that extend my discussion of the Chinese response to the coronavirus and its ripples around the world, such as the Dr. Blass discussion of social media in the United States. And Dr. Ji's comparison of Chinese American culture, I encourage you to gain insights from their perspectives and keep learning about this very important topic, just as you are doing now with me. For which I thank you. I wish you the best, and、I、look forward to hearing your questions and comments.